I am the chairperson of the board of directors of Volunteers of America of Southeast Louisiana. Um, I've been on the board for about 10 years. Um, I am an adoptive parent through the agency. Um, I'm also a local attorney. I've been practicing law for 25 years in Gretna, Louisiana. And um, that's about what you need to know about me. So uh, I'm gonna ask everybody to please mute themselves so we don't have a lot of feedback. Um, and I apologize if any part of my Zoom is messed up today. Uh, Zoom thwarts me on occasion. Um, Volunteers of America of Southeast Louisiana, a lot of people don't realize, um, has over 20 programs that serve a multitude of vulnerable populations in essentially a 16 parish community. Um, we call ourselves Southeast Louisiana because we go all the way out to the river parishes and um, the Florida parishes, which we'll talk about today. So today we really want to focus though on one program and one issue uh, where we serve vulnerable members of our communities, um, which is our community members who struggle with opioid use. Um, we're extremely, extremely grateful for Florida Parish's Human Services Authority, which formed a partnership with us to establish an opioid mobile response team for the Florida parishes, which you're gonna hear about today and then hear about the great work that they're all doing. For those of you who don't know, okay, um, I guess some people don't, the Florida parishes include St. Tammany, Washington, Tangipahoa, Livingston, and St. Helena. And so um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Forrest VG, who is our CEO and president and have her um, introduce um, the Florida parish versus Human Services Authority and other people who are gonna to talk to us today about the opioid crisis. Thank you, Christy. And thanks to all of you all who are attending our fifth virtual community forum. Volunteers America Southeast Louisiana is celebrating 125 years of serving our community. And it is always a good day to bring people together to talk about important issues we face. I wanna give a special thanks to the Florida Parishes Human Services Authority. We would not be here talking about this program if it weren't for them. And I cannot say enough about how crucial our partnership is. We are incredibly grateful to have Heather Grenall representing the Florida Parishes Human Services Authority on our panel today. And in just the past five months, the opioid mobile response team has completed 82 screenings, 1,321 calls, served 52 family members, and provided outreach to 159 providers. They are doing life-saving work every day. We are also grateful to State Representative Melinda White, who has been a consistent and passionate advocate for vulnerable people, including those struggling with opioid use disorder. I really enjoy logging on to these forums and diving deeper into our programs and critical issues facing our community. By engaging members of our community, public officials and donors, we, find, we may find new needs and make new connections in the community and the people we serve are ultimately the beneficiaries. At the same time, we are spreading the word about the wonderful work we are doing in a 16 parish community area. We are blessed in the Florida parishes with an incredible funding partner. As I spoke of earlier, the Florida parishes human services authority, but there are a lot of services throughout the 16 parishes we serve that aren't fully funded. In fact, more than 47,000 of the most vulnerable in our community receive support and care from Volunteers of America. One of our goals is to bridge the gap in funding so the folks who require our services get their needs met. Yes, we, we and our community partners have lots of good work to do to be there for the children, the veterans, the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, those who struggle with addiction, and so many more individuals who are in need of our care. So thank you all for attending this community uh, virtual forum as we share more information about, uh, about the opioid services. And now I'd like to introduce our Director of Government and Community Relations, Nick Alvarez. 
Nick? Thanks a lot, Boris. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna give you all an overview of today's agenda. As you heard, we have Heather Gurnall from the Florida Parishes Human Services Authority. She's gonna lead us off and she's gonna talk about her work and the partnership with Volunteers of America Southeast Louisiana. After Heather, Jean Lovern and her team from Volunteers of America are going to speak about how the opioid mobile response team works with people experiencing opioid crisis. After the team finishes, State Representative Melinda White will discuss her reflections as a community leader in the Florida parishes and as a state representative. So after Representative White speaks, we're gonna turn this into a conversation. Throughout the presentations, if a question comes to mind, simply type it into the chat and I'll pose those questions to our panel of speakers. I'll try to get to as many questions as possible in the time we have together. All right, let's get started. Heather Gurnold is the Centralized Care Coordination Supervisor at Florida Parishes Human Services Authority. She started her career working with individuals with developmental disabilities. This is where her love of advocating for others began. Now, Ms. Gurnold advocates for those struggling with behavioral health issues by offering support and connection to vital resources. I can't emphasize enough what you've already heard, our thanks for the partnership with Florida Parishes Human Services Authority. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Heather Gurnold. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much, Nick. And uh, thanks so much everyone for having me here. Um, again, my name is Heather Gurnold and I am with Florida Parishes Human Services Authority. In addition to um, the care coordination, um, I also oversee the opioid specific programs with Florida Parishes. The, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Human Services Authority, we are a local governing entity. Um, we have five outpatient behavioral health clinics and we have one residential um, behavioral health facility. So whenever I started working with Florida Parishes, um, it was for the state targeted response to the opioid epidemic, which was a grant that came from the state level. Um, and so the whole point of that was for us to kind of do a lot of outreach and education to really connect those struggling with opioid dependence, um, get them connected with treatment. Um, we distribute um, all of the Narcan. We have given out probably, I'm gonna say roughly 4,000 kits of Narcan, which is about 8,000 doses um, in the past maybe three years. Um, and we, like I said, I did a lot of outreach. I worked with a lot of professionals, probation and parole, law enforcement. Um, fire departments, family members, people in the community, just so they could kind of be more educated about what was available, um, how we can support each other, how we can, you know, they can support their family members. Um, but we still felt like there was some gaps. Um, we didn't feel like we were able to reach everyone who really needed um, our services. So whenever the Lasore project came about, which is the Louisiana State Opioid Response, which is the funding for the opioid mobile response team, Florida parishes absolutely jumped on it because in addition to the STR program, we knew that we needed something in the community to um, help connect these people to services. You know, I know a lot of the phone calls that they receive are from family members who have no idea, you know, how to even begin looking for treatment um, because this is a very difficult, you know, world to navigate, you know, so if you don't really know all the different places and behavioral health facilities and whatnot, um, you really need somebody to guide you through that. And the opioid mobile response team has done an absolutely beautiful job of that, um, you know, because they're out there, they're in the community, they're connecting with people and they're receiving phone calls, you know, 24 hours a day. Um, because if they're calling one of our clinics and if it's after hours, you know, it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to feel motivated and encouraged to continue that search. Um, whereas if you receive in phone calls 24 hours a day. Um, the mobile team has really, really kind of bridged a lot of barriers and filled some of those gaps. Um, a huge one has been the folks, especially during COVID that have been in jail. Um, even before COVID times, if, if you didn't have two or $300 to have someone come in and assess you to get you referred to treatment, you were just going to sit in jail. Um, and a lot of times that is not going to do anything for your recovery. 
Um, so they have, I know we get at Florida parishes, we get tons and tons of phone calls from family members saying, hey, my loved one's in jail and they really need to go to treatment. You know, what can we do? And, you know, my first thought is always let's get them connected to the mobile team because they are the ones who do all of this legwork to get all of these things done. Um, and they do a wonderful job of connecting the family members to services to support them because we all know addiction is not just a disease for that one person. It's a family disease and it's, you know, all encompassing. Um, so that, like I said, they're doing a wonderful job of um, being in the community, being accessible and providing, you know, the peer services, the peer support specialists, that is such a crucial part in getting, um, you know, those struggling with addiction to get them just engaged, just to be there to provide support. Perhaps they're not ready to go to treatment, but they are ready to have someone there that they can talk to that can encourage them and support them until they are ready. And then we have our um, licensed mental health professional and our licensed practical nurse there that can kind of do those other things, get the assessments done, you know, say, hey, I'm the nurse and I'm seeing what's going on. Maybe you have some cellulitis or we have these things and they can also provide that really important um, education and information so they can also kind of take care of the other things in their life that are going on. Um, and I know that Florida Parishes is really fortunate to be working with VOA um, because, you know, like I said, it's it's a lot of work and we still have a lot to do. Um, but I mean, the the success stories that I hear, um, you know, we get constant phone calls of people saying, hey, I, you know, I, this person talked to this person, talked to this person, they said we should call. And um, the, the fact that people are telling their friends about the services that we are offering shows that what we are doing is, is helping and it's making a difference. Um, and I'm really excited to see what else we can do. Um, you know, we're always talking and figuring out new ways that we can work together, you know, the clinics working with um, the mobile team and vice versa. And, you know, we work really well together. And um, I'm really excited to see what else we can do with this mobile team. Thanks so much, Heather. I think that really set the stage for how the team does this work in the Florida parishes. And so now we're going to delve in a little bit deeper and hear directly from the members of the opioid mobile response team. And to do that, I'm gonna first introduce Jean Lovern. Jean is the Assistant Director of Foreshore Services with Volunteers of America Southeast Louisiana. Over the years with the agency, she has worked to provide stable housing for unhoused people with a disabling condition. Helping others experience a better quality of living makes life more meaningful and fulfilling for Jean. I'll now turn it over to John Lovern and the Opioid Mobile Response Team. Thanks, Thank John. You. Thank you, Nick, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I would like to share information on the Opioid Mobile Response Team funded through Florida Parish's Human Services Authority. Our team accepts post-crisis referrals, and within 24 hours of getting a call, the team connects with individuals, family members, and or collaterals who have experienced an opioid crisis to provide direct services, referrals, and guidance about available options and services. The team works to raise awareness about the devastating effects of opioid abuse and encourages and motivates individuals who are opioid dependent to access treatment. The team connects with persons served through regular phone calls or in person until the individual is connected to needed community resources. Our highly trained team includes a peer support specialist, a licensed mental health professional, and a licensed practical nurse to ensure that individuals are directed to the proper care. In addition, peer support specialists are available in Florida Parishes, Human Services Authorities, Behavioral Health Clinics in Mandeville, Slidell, Bugalusa, and Hammond. I would like to introduce you to our outstanding team, and they will share why they do this work. First is our licensed professional counselor, Lori Anderson. Thank you, Jean. It's a pleasure to be here today and be able to talk to you about our program. Uh, they asked, why do we do this work? The main thing in a nutshell for me, it's because parents are crying. I receive phone calls from parents and family members that don't know where to turn when they have a loved one who's in the vicious cycle of addiction. And that's one thing this position allows me to do is provide that emotional support and education and ongoing comfort for those family members 
of those affected by drugs and alcohol, usually opioid use and probably substance. And this work allows me that supportive role for those people. That bond is formed for the family from the first phone call, sometimes even before we speak to the participant and uh, provide that emotional support. And then we follow them on from there. So often that's missing in some of the treatment programs and it is a vital, vital part of the recovery process. Thank you. Thank you. Our peer support specialist, Cabrina Longman. Good morning, everyone, and thank y'all for having me here. My name is Karina Longman, and I am the peer support specialist, which means I've actually been there. Um, I'm an addict in recovery, and I relate to our clients by sharing my experience, strength, and hope. And, you know, finally, my struggles that I went through can hopefully save someone else and, and bring them to and through their path to recovery. And our licensed practical nurse, Donna Rome. Hi everybody, thank you. My name is Donna Rome. And the reason I do what I do is that I feel that there's so many people out there that can benefit from recovery or addiction. You know, it's so rampant in today's society. And a lot of people don't even know where to start looking. But we've had so many success stories with our program, such as children that were reunited with their parents, families that haven't spoken in years, talking and trusting each other and working together. Young adults that had no hope in their life besides drug use are now, they're now working. They're helping others on their journey of freedom from addiction. It's a great program. Thank you. A major reason we do what we do is to help those in need. I would like to introduce you to a very special lady, Janine, who would like to share her story. Hello everyone, my name is Janine. Um, my clean date is December 2nd of 2010. My substance abuse career began way before I began actually taking the substances. My life began early with multiple areas of abuse I endured beginning at the age of eight. So I had a rocky, rocky jump start. I then married an abuser, I had two children. And then I saw the vicious cycle going around again. I then got divorced. In the meantime, though, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and bilateral breast cancer. I then had 27 reconstructive surgeries. This is how I began taking opioids. The surgeries were all within a 12-year span. Um, I, you know, pain management clinics. We are here to help walk through this. Pain management clinics uh, began popping up all over the place. Uh, then getting the pain medications became way too easy. But then but they then began closing down a few years later. This is when I began doctor shopping to maintain my opioid needs. I was a registered nurse and thought I was invincible, not to mention back then I knew multiple doctors. So it was extremely easy to get pain medication, um, especially when you know what to say and how to get it. Um, then we would fast forward 10 years. The pharmacies began linking their computers. When one uses multiple pharmacies and doctors, the computers were then intertwined and I then began being investigated by the DEA. I was unaware in the beginning. Um, then I was eventually arrested. I spent one night in jail and then I was bailed out. Then I began a two year long court battle, which I lost in December 2nd of 2010. I went to court that day. I was then confronted and charged. My life was over as I knew it. I lost my nursing license. I spent six months in Tallulah, which is big girls prison. By the grace of God, I was released early. I only spent six months to the day. I then was given drug court, which saved my life. Many say this program is set up to fail us. I do beg to differ. If you are ready and willing, this program really works. You, you can say that my rehab was prison, which scared me straight. I was then blessed to have gone back to grad school to become an addictions counselor, and I'm now pursuing a PhD in psychology. My divine intervention was a lifesaver. Even though I lost one career, I was able to gain a new career. And mind you, this was hard, hit 40-ish, but it can be done. It all depends on how bad you want recovery and if you're willing to live life on life's terms. I want to thank the BOA Southeast Region and Florida Parishes for giving me the opportunity to share my story in hopes of helping another individual. I am a true testimony that recovery works. You just need to be willing to change and the rest will fall into place. 
Thank you for having me. Thank you, Janine, for sharing your moving story. Did you know in Louisiana in 2018, 70% of overdose deaths involved in opioid? The opioid related death rates were high among those recently released from prison, those that obtained prescriptions um, from multiple pharmacies, and those who were prescribed opioids in conjunction with other narcotic medications. We at the Opioid Mobile Response Team work closely with the probation and parole offices, specialty courts, Department of Children and Family Services, and the jails to provide much needed services. Believe it or not, most opioid addicts didn't become addicted until their prescriptions for pain medication ran out. And that's when heroin comes in. Sadly, this has become a public health crisis on so many levels. We now are faced with babies being born addicted to opioids and suffering terrible withdrawal symptoms. The HIV and hepatitis C infection rates are much higher due to the rise in intravenous drug, drug use. In conclusion, our overall goal is to guide these people into the proper treatments and help them become healthy, successful, and productive members of society. Well, as you can see, there's a whole list of opioid side effects. Um, dependence is probably one of the most dangerous side effects. Dependence means feeling withdrawal symptoms when you're not taking the drug. Withdrawal symptoms can include, not limited to, fever, cravings, mood changes, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and all kinds of sleep disturbances. Addiction is a chronic pain, is a chronic disease that causes a person to compulsively seek out drugs despite the risk of using them. The risk of dependence and addiction are higher among those who misuse their medications. So it's important to understand your risk. Uh, it's likely that everyone on this call knows at least one person who is struggling with an addiction. Um, it's important to understand the risk factors and how best to manage them. Here listed on this slide are some of the risks. We've already discussed, but it is so common that prescription opioids can lead to dependence, but after less than a week of use, especially if they're taken in other ways than prescribed. You have options. If you are prescribed an opioid, make sure to develop a clear plan with your provider. Talk to your doctor about side effects, risk, and addiction. Take your opioids exactly as prescribed and never share your medication. Store your medication in a place where children or others cannot access them. Dispose of your expired unwanted and unused medications safely. There are drop boxes at local police stations. Other pain treatments may work better and have fewer risks than opioids. Over-the-counter medicines, non-drug treatments, and other prescription drugs may also prove helpful in alleviating pain. Why this work is critical. Were you aware that 30% of all opioid deaths in the state of Louisiana happened in the Florida parishes in 2019? Did you know roughly 21 to 29% of patients prescribed opioid for chronic pain misused them? Between eight to 12% develop an opioid use disorder. About 80% of people who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. And as Boris mentioned earlier, in the past five months, the team has completed 82 screenings, 1,321 calls, served 52 family members, provided outreach to 159 community providers, distributed 23 Narcan kits, and provided 26 educational trainings on Narcan. And that, um, that is 30% of all opioid involved deaths. So I think I missed the 30%. We are a team whose goal is to save lives. And how does the team do the work?
Our team meets people when they need help the most and provides guidance to connect them with local treatment centers. The licensed practical nurse assesses and assists with gaining medical clearances, making medical recommendations, and connecting clients to treatment. The licensed mental health professional assesses and identifies mental health concerns, makes appropriate referrals to different levels of care, and connects clients to treatment. The certified peer support specialist assesses, provides support, shares experiences, connects to community supports and treatments. Peer support services are delivered by individuals who have similar life experiences with the people they are serving. A typical day at the office. Well, okay, a typical day at our office varies each and every day. Typically, we start with the meeting to catch up on anything new, things that we may be having trouble with, some brainstorming on some of our patients. Um, we start receiving phone calls from family members, friends, probation officers, Department of Children Family Services, the jails, and many, many other people. We usually when these phone calls come in, we attempt to set up screens to get more information on the client and or the family members. We do also ask them if they would like Narcan training, if they do, then we'll go ahead and set up a time to do Narcan training or we'll call Florida Parishes and get them to mail some Narcan out to them. Um, so once the screening is done, we'll contact other parties involved, such as their probation officers, treatment facilities, case managers, anything to see what's available for this client. And then we set up a time for these clients to get a treatment and make sure there's no obstacles standing in the way, such as any kind of legal obligations that they have to fulfill first, um, um, transportation, stuff like that. Um, after the client has been placed, we then try and check on them for like once a week while they're in treatment. Um, and hopefully we'll get involved in their treatment plans and their discharge plans. Um, after they get out, we will then keep in contact with those clients and family members for at least a year to see if there's any other services that we can provide. Our day will also consist of community outreach, reach, visiting police stations, fire departments, hospital emergency rooms, gas stations, as I said before, providing our hand training, um, just to let the people out there in our community know what services we offer and how we can help them. And then we also talk to the treatment facilities. We get bed availability, insurance information, and with the new COVID guidelines, uh, what are they expecting from our clients? Staff work together to provide services, truly a team approach. The team can provide education, outreach, active opioid use disorder care, overdose support, after treatment recovery care, coordinate admissions to detox and or inpatient facilities, make referrals for medication assisted treatment, make referrals to mental health services, provide primary responses to pregnant women and IV drug users, provides Narcan, connects to community supports, provides support and encouragement, and introduces those struggling with substance abuse to recovery programs. Family members also benefit from the services provided. Grief counseling and support sessions are provided for survivors, family members, and loved ones who have lost someone to an overdose. The team also provides preventative and treatment education to family members, loved ones, and significant others. Another complication for those suffering from opioid use disorder is the pandemic. COVID-19 has worsened the opioid epidemic with increased social isolation and higher occurrences of mental health issues, helping people overcome addiction has become more difficult. We are hearing this in the news locally and nationally. The team has continued to give essential services during this time. 
We are picking up the phone and giving services or using Zoom to complete screenings to see people and what they are going through. We will continue to help those in need during this difficult time. Our services are provided in the Florida parishes, which include St. Tammany, Washington, St. Helena, Tangipaho, and Livingston. The team can be contacted through the 1-800 number or the email address provided on the screen. Always in the event of an emergency, 911 should be called. Also, for additional resources, go to opioidhelpla.org. Thank you for allowing us to share information regarding the opioid response team this morning. Nick, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Jean, Janine, Donna, Cabrina, and Lori. Your work, uh, your vulnerability in sharing your stories uh, and your passion, I think we all can agree are really, really inspiring. And so I really appreciate all that you do each and every day and I, I appreciate you being with us today to share those stories. We look forward to delving in even more when we move to the discussion. And speaking of which, this is just a reminder that if you do have any questions, please put that, those into the chat. I haven't seen any come through so far. And so we will move to those after we hear from our next speaker, State Representative Melinda White. And I do want to say State Representative Melinda White truly is a passionate advocate and leader for the most vulnerable. Representative Melinda White is a member of the Louisiana House of Representatives from Bogalusa. She is a member of the Committee on Ways and Means, House and Governmental Affairs, and Agriculture, Forestry, Aquaculture, and Rural Development. Among her accomplishments are being founder and executive chairwoman of the Bogalusa Blues and Heritage Festival, which by the way, I hear is back on for September 24th and 25th this year. I know I'll be there. Um, in addition, she also was a member of the Washington Parish Commission on Human Services, a court appointed special advocate for foster children and a board member for the Youth Services Bureau of St. Tammany in Washington Parishes. Representative White is truly one of the most determined advocates for vulnerable people in the state legislature. She has strongly supported enhanced funding for intellectual and developmental disability services, something critically important for Volunteers of America. And she's been a leader in the area of opioid use disorder treatment as well, our topic today. Representative White was the driving force behind the creation of the Woodlake Addiction Recovery Center in Bogalusa a facility the Opioid Mobile Response Team partners with on a regular basis. So thanks for being with us, Representative White. I know you're juggling many things this morning, including a legislative hearing. So we really appreciate your time and I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you all for your stories and for your um, offering your services and telling us everyone about them. They're so important. They're so important to our community. Um, I um, began with the, I guess, when it comes to the overdoses and the opiate use and all that, we faced it within our own family uh, several years ago. And it really, I'd never been around it, didn't know a lot about it, had to call family doc, you know, a family member, doctor, and our family just say, how do we handle this? What can we do? It, we didn't seem to have anyone around us. Um, that we could reach out to to help. Uh, since then, I can tell you that, uh, so it was my goal to begin with to try to get a rehab center, a healing center in our parish that would serve our region, especially after seeing the numbers of opiate deaths per capita being so high and we're a very rural area. So it was, it was, um, it was very disturbing, but having faced that within my own family and with um, children that were falling through the cracks was what really got me involved in being a CASA volunteer, knowing what's down the streets and behind the doors and trying to meet people where they are. Um, it was very revealing to me. And so as soon as I became a legislator, I started working on trying to find how we can put together some sort of healing center and 
I found um, the old charity hospital, which was uh, the being used by the angels, literally the angels hospital. They were in the position of transition in their site board over to their original hospital, which would vacate that building. And so I just felt it was, it was um, opportunity to do something with it. It took a while to work through the legalities of that leases and subleases and things like that and bringing the hospital up to code um, for our inpatient services that Woodlake Recovery Center uh, provides for us in our area now. But I will tell you before that became a reality and everyone in the community knew this is something that I'm very passionate about working on. So I would actually have addicts that would walk in the doors in my office, um, parents with um, addict, addicted children, um, adults addicted. I got a lot of phone calls. Had it not been for your mobile unit, um, we had, I don't know what I would have done because they were looking for me to help them connect and get somewhere. And we had not set up, you know, the um, recovery center had not been set up yet. So I called um, one of your persons all the time and immediately he would go, no matter where they are, he met them where they were at and he would get them to facilities um, or whatever was needed. And, and what's amazing about him is that he went through this himself. He was a recovering addict and he got it, he understood. And I think that really helps um, when you're connecting with people that are in all this turmoil and, um, you have someone that's been through it, it really helps speak their language to help um, in the trust factor, I think, and just getting them into a safe place and understand why they need to be in that safe place. Um, so, you know, um, I can say that it is was a godsend. The Lord, Volunteers of America has been a godsend to our area um, to really help our people going through this. I think you know, with the addictions, there's, it's just a long, slow suicide process is the way I've seen it, you know, and hopeless, helplessness, people not seeing any way out of it. And so it's, you know, and children falling through the cracks and suffering because of it. There's another part of it that I'm really trying to figure out how we can help is women that are, um, addicted to opioids and pregnant. And I've searched the laws and I've met with people here about it and there is no fear for them. We need them to know that they can get help and through that pregnancy, they don't go to jail for that. Um, there is no law that would um, arrest them over that. And so it's really just a matter of getting the word out. We wanna be able to take care of these mothers during that pregnancy so that um, the children that are being born will not be born with all these addictions and issues that sometimes follow them their whole lives um, it, into the classrooms. And so that's uh, another you know, thing I'm trying to work on, put together, you know, billboards, pregnant, addicted, call this number, like what I saw a women's hospital in Baton Rouge do. Um, that's what we're really trying to, to put together and would love anybody's help on that. Um, but again, um, I am so thankful for you all and what you do and your devotion to it uh, to help people in a crisis in one of the darkest moments of their lives and help them find that there is an end, a light at the end of the tunnel, that they can rebuild their lives. And this is the most critical part of rebuilding families in Louisiana. And uh, that's something that I think we all need to work on. That's the, um, the foundation for us in life is our family and, and, and keeping that solid and helping during times of crisis like this is, is God's work. And thank you so much for being the angels there for us to help us in our area um, where it's um, really extreme high cases. Thank you so much for having us, Nick. Thank you for including me. And Heather um, and is a part of our Washington Parish Coalition group. It's a, um, something we've been doing for years. It's getting stronger. Um, we've also, with the help of LDH, have Bogalusa Strong stood up, which is building a healthier community. 
And all of that involvement has created uh, people that generally work in silos. They're actually communicating together and finding out that we have these services to help people through all these processes. And so those um, coalitions have really helped understand who's doing what and where the services are, where to send people for any kind of need, really, not just in the opiate crisis situation. So um, I uh, see that Taffy Morrison is a guest on, and she really helped us build Bogalusa Strong. And uh, we're working on Franklin to focus, which is our town city in the Washington Parish within my district. So um, thank you so much again. And yes, I'm in a legislative hearing, but um, I took a little break here to be with you all. It's very important to me. And um, feel free to reach out to me with any ideas, anything that we can do, or any assistance you need. Um, I'm available. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Representative White. We really appreciate you being here. And we appreciate all the work you do in the community. And I can just say, you know, I know, having been in Bogalusa and, and seeing you do the work, uh, you really are passionate and you're really there for the people. Um, and I've seen that. I, I can remember the groundbreaking at Woodlake and you spoke so eloquently, so passionately about the most vulnerable. And that's what we're about here at Volunteers of America, Southeast Louisiana. So thank you to you and to everyone who has been part of our panel. And we're now going to move into the discussion phase. And so again, if you do have questions, we started to see some come in, um, but please put any other questions that come to mind in the chat. Uh, I'll start with the first one that came through. And this one says, do you have clients that are not yet ready for treatment? If so, do you provide another set of services for them? So uh, Jean and team, who wants to take that one? Lori, would you like to take that question? Oh, sure. And of course, we have an awful lot of clients that are not re yet, yet ready for treatment. Oftentimes, it is, um, they are ready, they say they're ready, but getting them, you know, in that car and to the facility is a huge, huge challenge. That's a big step. So understanding that and being empathetic in those situations. We do have other services, and one of the main things is having them come up with a plan the plan that is catered for them, a treatment plan that will include their concerns and something that they're willing to do. Uh, we can't make anybody go into treatment. We can't make anybody change. But if we can give them an idea of this is a plan and this is a step, do we need detox? Do we need inpatient? Do we need 30, 60, 90 day? Do we want something longer term? Are we looking at sober living after it? We need to come up with that plan that's catered for that individual. We got a better shot of them going into treatment. But that's an excellent question, thank you. Hey, Lori, do you mind if I also just kind of add something? Um, so I just wanted to add that the most important thing that you can do for someone who does not feel that they are um, ready to um, enter treatment of any kind is just maintain that, that safe, supportive rapport with that person. So even if it's just, you know, checking in once a week, once a month or whatever, um, they know that they have a place that they can go to whenever they are ready. We've had many times people come into the clinic kind of on the fence thinking maybe um, might be ready, maybe not. And then it turns out they're like, mm, I'm not ready yet. And that's okay. You know, we, all, we always go over like harm reduction with them. We offer them Narcan, um, give them a way to contact us. We'll try, if they're okay with it, we'll try to reach out to them, you know, periodically just to touch base. Um, and many, many, many times we've had people come back a few months later, a year later, a year and a half or two years later, or maybe they did go through treatment, but maybe they're struggling, maybe they've relapsed and people come back and, you know, reach out because they remember that this place was a safe place for me. I was not judged. I didn't feel like there was any stigma. Um, and I know that I can go to them whenever I am ready. So we had another question come through the chat. It says there are fewer rehab centers in Louisiana per capita than most other states and other addictions such as alcohol are still pervasive. How do you balance the current landscape with the impact of the opioid flood? 
And I'll open this up to anyone, but maybe Representative White, you might speak to this uh, because of, of your work, I know, with, with Woodlake. Maybe if you want to start us off and share kind of your experience, um, which you, you got into a little bit during your initial comments. Yes, um, I have to close the door. I'm here in the Senate side in a little hole. Um, yeah, that was, um, there's a great need for it. Um, the facility is immediately filled as soon as we opened it. I mean, it was maxed out. Um, it's, um, there's definitely a need for it. It wasn't easy for me to get that. You know, I had to keep bringing people back around the table to, to get it done, but that, that was a matter of mostly facility things um, and legalities. Um, so it just took a while, but uh, I think that it would help if we had more services all over the state and we bring the clients that come to that Woodlake. Um, I see they come from everywhere. They're not just from our area. They're, they're from all over the state. So I think we need it myself. And I know that ours filled up quickly and it stays rotating full. Heather, do you have any uh, reflections on that question as well? Sorry, I was muted. Um, there are a lot more resources than I think anyone is really aware of. And if you're not really part of that world, um, you don't know about it and you don't have any idea about it. Um, I, I'm at our residential facility right now and there are every single day phone calls coming in saying, hey, this is a situation. This is what I have going on. Um, you know, can, can you help me? And a lot of times people are very taken back by how quickly we're able to place them somewhere. Um, and they're like, wasn't really ready today, maybe not even tomorrow. Um, you know, so, so maybe we can get something going for next week or whatnot. Um, and there are a lot of grants out there. I know Woodlake has grants for people who don't have any type of insurance. Um, you know, and there are options out there. It's just like I said before, if you're not part of this world and you're not working in it day in and day out, you're, you you don't know what you don't know. And that's why it's so important um, that we have our opioid mobile response team because their whole job is dedicated to finding these resources and connecting people to them. Um, and obviously, you know, they have people who are struggling with alcoholism, um, you know, stimulant use or, and whatnot. Um, so th there are some resources out there. Um, you just have to know right people, I guess, like I said, so that's what it's so, so, so crucial that we have the mobile team out in the community um, so people can access those services. Great, the next question that I wanted to get to is around resources for pregnant women who are struggling with opioid use disorder. That was something that Cabrina, you touched on a little bit and Representative White, you talked about, you know, um, what is the situation if, if there's a woman who is struggling with opioid use disorder, um, who is pregnant, what services do you refer to? What's the process? And is there a need for housing um, and treatment for those women um, currently? And, and where, where might there be gaps and what services are currently there and, and what, what could be provided? Donna works very closely with DC um, Department of Child and Family Services. Donna, would you would would you like to address this question? Sure, I will. Um, I work really close with DCFS. Those are most of my clients. Um, we will get a call from their case managers and saying, "Okay, well, such and such needs treatment. You know, what do you suggest?" Um, very few facilities will take a pregnant woman over X amount of, I think it's like 30 weeks or something like that. Um, but uh, we do work really close with a handful, maybe less facilities that will take them and we utilize them a lot. Um, they go in, they get their treatment, they come out and they're pretty much back in good graces with DCFS and, you know, everything will be good after that. But yeah, we, we do work a lot with them. And as far as the answer to earlier, um, we are out there 
and we call every facility basically in the state of Louisiana. So we know how many beds are out there. We know um, when there's bed availability. There's just, so we're always researching. And if I could piggyback onto that, one of the things that Donna has done an excellent job in doing is solidifying the relationship with the St. Tammany Parish Coroner's Office, the Safe Kid uh, Crib Program, um, so that we are adding additional services and resources for those clients of us that are pregnant and having children or um, have recently had a child. So um, we make a lot of community connections that way. Great. All right. We got one more question coming through the chat. Uh, it says, how do you connect with potential clients? Uh, do you get referrals from law enforcement, first responders, hospitals? Are they all self-referral? And I, I think the answer is all of the above, but I, if somebody wants to get uh, go a little deeper into that. Um, so I can say, um, and this was even, I think, before that we had started with our opioid mobile response team. Um, like I said, I had, you know, done a lot of work with uh, doing outreach and work with first responders, um, probation parole and whatnot. And so when I started doing Narcan training, I would kind of talk about, um, you know, how we can support others who are trying to help address the opioid epidemic. So again, we're not all working in silos. Um, it initially started kind of with that, and um, and then once our mobile team had kind of um, started to you know get developed, I, I started kind of sharing the information on how to for them to make referrals from there. Um, the first time a probation officer called me, um, it was it was probably a couple of weeks after I had presented into an Arcan training, and he was like, "You said to call if we ever needed help with somebody." He like, "So I'm taking you up on it," and I I, I could tell he kind of felt like he was just taking a shot in the dark. Um, but I mean, I, I talk to him all the time. I mean, we call and text, uh, you know, he is always looking for ways to help these offenders as they call, you know, clients or um, people struggling with addiction. And he passes it on to his folks and, you know, they're passing it on to their folks. Um, you know, I had a doctor call me yesterday because he was like, hey, I have this guy, you know, what can we do, whatever, whatever. Um, and then as far as the mobile team, usually if I'm getting somebody from probation parole calling me and one of their folks is in jail, I pass that on to the mobile team um, because they just respond so quickly and they do such a wonderful job working with those people. Um, I know a lot of the times um, the referrals are coming from family members, um, they're coming from the jails, um, and they're coming, they're coming from us. You know, we, you know, while we do provide behavioral health services in our clinics. Sometimes the person, um, they're either they're not willing to come into the clinic or we can't get a hold of them, or the mobile team just has something to offer that we, you know, in the clinic setting just can't offer them. Um, so anyone and everyone can make a referral to the mobile team. You know, they have, the, it's, it's really, really easy. You either have the email, they have the phone number. Um, and, you know, it can just be like, hey, you know, I'm really worried about this person and they're kind of on the fence. This is the information I have. And the mobile team can reach out and they can do what they can. And if the person isn't ready, then like I said, we go over the Narcan harm reduction, um, you know, ways to contact. And they can, you know, whenever that person is ready, they can then reach out to the mobile team as, again. Great. Thank you so much. You know, another important question that I wanted to pose to the group is around the, the, the issue of stigma. Uh, so often this disease really can be stigmatized and that can help perpetuate uh, this, this idea that there's something fundamentally wrong with people. But you know, we heard stories today of people who you know, seemingly um, are, are going about their lives, but because of one circumstance or another, uh, they are afflicted with, with this disease. I want to start with Representative White. Um, maybe what, what do you think we can do to overcome uh, this stigma that is sometimes associated with opioid use disorder or other uh, substance use disorders? Well, communicating about it um, helps. Um, getting the community knowing where the resources are 
and um, seeing success stories because before we had anything or we could reach out and figure out, you know, who to call and what to call, it causes so much dysfunction in the area that people uh, tend to, um, I think, give up on, on family members and walk away from them or uh, kick them out even. And uh, because it's very difficult dealing during that time with a family member that is addicted. And um, so I, I have witnessed it in my community, um, some, some things that bother me that, um, you know, we're not to give up on people and we should do everything we can to get them the resources and the help. And so I, you know, how to improve that. I, I think that getting these resources out into the community to get help, to give them that better life instead of just letting them spiral down to the grave because that's what's happening. Um, where um, I don't know any other way of saying it other than that there is um, that there is hope and there is help and you can rebuild your life and there are success stories and people need to know about them. Um, I have family members that went through this and you would never know that today. They're operating a business and working and, and thriving in the community and um, people need to understand that there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is help and not to just write someone off because they're addicted because it's a very hard, dark moment in a person's life when they're going through that. But I have witnessed people come out. I have witnessed people go through um, rehabs. Like I mentioned earlier, one of your um, Volunteers of America, um, Lenny, he was, um, he, he, I never, I grew up with him as a kid. You know, we never saw, I grew up with so many people that have later, you know, passed away from opiate overdose, but would never have seen themselves in that position. It's so strong that I say it's stronger than a mother and father's love because people um, actually will do anything they can to get that next tie, that next, you know, so it's very, very hard um, on the family. And so that, what, that tends to make people really look down on people when they're in this dark moment. Um, and, the, and the, sometimes the things that they do but we need to hear more about the success stories and that there is hope and to have faith in that and to um, help where we can with humans that are in this position to get them beyond that. And, to, and I think sharing success stories uh, really helps and then watching people that have overcome their addictions really thrive in the community and even be uh, most valuable resources for others that are struggling. Um, I know I called my friend, one of your co-workers, he was on my speed dial. He always went, whenever I called him, when I got the calls, when people questioned, he was out there and helping. So I know there's some success stories and I think sharing that and um, will really help people realize that there is there is hope and that you don't, don't give up, even though it's very hard. And usually, Sometimes it winds up with jail and court systems and things like that. Um, um, you know, there's definitely a stigma around that, but it doesn't have to be. And I know with my family member is that once they pick themselves up out of it, they never, they never talked about it or anything. They just, it was like, that, that, um, that's over in my life. And I'm only focused on what I'm doing right now in the future. And so it was, um, you know, I think sharing success stories and making sure everybody knows where the resources is and meeting people where they are when they're in trouble, including family members and the support system there. Thank you so much, Representative White. Uh, I, I wanna to turn to both Heather and Cabrina on the same question. We are running out of time. So Heather, Cabrina, if you could give us in 30 seconds or less, uh, the top point on how we can reduce stigma. That Those will be our closing thoughts. Um, I'll start. Um, so just real quick, the one thing that I really like to touch on 
um, when it comes to addiction is to really let people understand what it is and how it starts. Um, because, you know, I have a pretty judgmental family. Um, and so I kind of always talk to them and I'm like, it's, you know, it's not people just wanting to be high. It's all these adverse childhood experiences. It's trauma. Um, you know, there are so much that kind of feed into it. And it's not just one day this person decided to pick up and use. It's all of these things that kind of led up to it. Um, and, you know, anyone that knows me knows how passionate I am about what I do. And, I, you know, I do this, you know, with my family. I do this, you know, at the nail salon. I, you know, I'm always kind of talking to kind of share information with people and really just educating people on addiction itself and understanding how it starts and where it comes from and that it can happen to anyone. I have seen, you know, like I said, my family has been pretty judgmental and I'm seeing those walls starting to come down. So I know that, you know, that information is, is um, helpful for that. Brina, go ahead and give us the closing thought. So in closing, as an addict myself, I would have never dreamt I would ever be, be an addict. It was never anything um, based on the trauma, which now they are linking trauma as a re re response, you know, that is, that is why we use is a lot of it has to do with trauma with ACEs model and different things like that. The tools are actually getting out there and just publicizing more of, like she said, the success stories, because I, you know, as, as an addict, it's hard to get out of that vicious cycle and having the resources, getting those out to people, you know, things like that. That is really like, that's why I enjoy the mo mobile response team is because I am mobile and I can get out there and pat the pavement and show these people, Hey, there is a better way. I am an addict too. And we can do this together. Thank you so much, Cabrina. And thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to the Florida Parishes Human Services Authority. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, we look forward to seeing you on a future community forum. Uh, in the meantime, to learn more about our services at Volunteers of America, you can go to our website, www.voasela.org. So again, special thanks to Heather Gernold, to State Representative Melinda White, and to all of you for joining us today. And have a great uh, afternoon.